and welcome everybody to the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. And today we'll be covering the Ford walkout happens at the Louisville truck plant that happened last week as the UAW there goes on strike. The first governor's debate has taken place. We'll go over what we can learn from it. Then finally, Louisville city government goes full crazy when it installs a feminine product dispenser in the men's bathrooms and government buildings. We'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooperator Show. And as always, if you want to hear that last story, the city of Louisville installing feminine product dispensers in the men's bathrooms, uh, feel free. You got to head on over to the podcast format. And take a listen to this show there. I only do that last story for those who are listening in the podcast form. And you can catch that on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, Google, iHeart, Pandora, all other major podcasting platforms. But without further ado, let's get into it. Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. Uh, before I go into the stories, I do want to announce this. Um, there's an interesting event going on Friday, this Friday, Friday, October 20th at 11 o'clock, uh, located at 2404 Sir Barton Way. That's, of course, uh, the fork kind of near that fork bank there in Hamburg. There is an event for Daniel Cameron with Rand Paul. Uh, Daniel Cameron and Rand Paul um, will be doing an event there, 11 a.m. Friday, October 20th. Kind of interesting to say the least. You know, out of our state uh, politicians, Rand Paul seems to be the one putting uh, the most amount of public effort, at least, into Cameron, uh, doing events with him and everything else. I know I've seen Massey doing some events with Cameron as well. I don't know um, if, you know, people like Comer and Guthrie and others and Andy Barr, I think, has done a few events, but this is the first kind of major politician to do an event with Daniel Cameron, Rand Paul. So make sure you put it on your calendars. Once again, that's Friday, October 20th at 11 o'clock at 2404 Sir Barton Way here in Lexington. So 8,700 Ford factory workers at the Louisville truck plant walked out uh, on Thursday, uh, bringing the UAW strike to Kentucky. Of course, this has been a nationwide strike. They hadn't striked yet here in Kentucky. Oh, they did there just the other day. And that's something that was bound to happen after GM agreed to non, uh, to the, to the electric vehicle battery plants becoming unionized into the future. Ford has not agreed to that. And well, of course, you know, Kentucky has a Ford battery plant coming to it. So, of course, it only makes sense that uh, without Ford willing to cave to that uh, part of the agreement into, uh, of course, everybody getting back to work, not going on strike, it was bound to happen here in Louisville. Now, of course, the, the, the employees at large are striking for higher pay and a four-day, 32-hour work week and pay raises as much as 40%. Uh, but one of the demands from the union at large is to make sure that the new plant is included as union plants. Probably most likely, if I had to guess, I'm not in the head of these union bosses, but if I had to take a quick guess, I would assume that the union uh, leaders at large are asking for something that's rather hard to give the four day, 32 hour work week and 40% pay raise. And they're saying they're not willing to wiggle on that until Ford, of course, agrees to the battery plants into the future. And then perhaps they wiggle down on those other things because of course they're using the, the desire for higher pay and less work as a uh, chip to get their union members that currently are involved more excited. If it was just about unionizing those battery plants, you wouldn't see, I think, as much support from the actual UAW workers um, where they're willing to strike and really supportive of it. But the four day, 32 hour work week, 40% increase in pay. Of course, that is something that they get pretty excited about. But Ford uh, not being caving on those electric vehicle battery plants is a big sticking point. And well, if I'm to be quite honest, um, a part of it too for the unions is maintaining control and their employees. Because if 10 or 20% of the car business moves from gas to electrical, well, that's a reduction in at least 10 to 20% of union employees. That means less power to the UAWs because they have less constituents, less people, of course, giving 
the money, the less money they bring in, the less they can influence those credibly important to them elections that they want to deal with. I mean, realistically, there's only so many cars you can sell uh, in the country like U.S. and where EVs uh, would be considered now, they're now opening up a little bit of a market because generally speaking, the car market per se, as far as number of customers, isn't really growing. I guess it grows as population does or grows in raw dollars as inflation hits. But the car market, as far as potential customers, stays pretty stagnant. Now, covering gas-powered vehicles or converting, sorry, gas-powered vehicle customers into electric vehicle customers, well, now everybody's a customer. Again, it's a whole new product. But Here's the problem for companies like Ford and others trying to get into the electric vehicle market and the problem that comes with unionized shops, and that's Tesla. Tesla holds about half, if not more, of the electric vehicle car market. And Tesla now, Tesla makes a growth, gross profit of 18.1% and a net profit of 12.97%. And that's according to recent financial disclosures. Ford, on the other hand, and their gas-powered vehicles, or Ford at large, has a 15% gross profit on its vehicles, so 3% lower, uh, but still there. But the net profit is only 2.4% for Ford. And what that means is, is if gas auto manufacturers like Ford want to uh, compete in that electric market, want to compete with Tesla, they're going to have to bring over a business model different than what they're doing in gas because Tesla can frankly price them out of it. And something, by the way, that Tesla has already been doing in order to solidify its holding. They've been dropping the price of Teslas in order to make it to where these big auto manufacturers like Ford, like Chevy, are having a harder time competing on the price because it just costs them more to manufacture. And a big part of that has to do with labor costs. Now, um, so if Ford obviously wants to compete, they're going to have to figure out a way to make more net profit so they can afford to price compete with Tesla. Otherwise, Tesla will try to just basically uh, price them out of the market and price them back into the gas market. Now, 2.4% profit from Ford really isn't a lot, but this is something the labor unions either don't understand or really uh, are purposely misrepresenting because all they say is, oh, well, Ford made billions and is having record profits. Of course, record profits are going to happen when you have crazy inflation rates like we've had over the last several years. And also the unions don't understand that business, especially new business area like electric vehicles um, isn't a, a build it and they'll come kind of situation right now, you're going to have to compete. Now, according to Bloomberg, Ford, when considering total compensation, this includes hourly pay benefits and per hour tax costs, because remember what you pay in taxes to the federal government, like uh, Social Security and Medicare, uh, your employer matches. Also, you got workers' comp, which is on a percentage base, insurance, health insurance, uh, a whole lot of other things that go into the expense. So the total cost per hour, according to Bloomberg, is $64 per labor hour. That doesn't include the UAW's new demands of a 40% pay raise, uh, a defined benefit package, which will cost more, and a 32-hour work week. So already, uh, they're at 64 an hour and need more. And as I said, that doesn't mean Ford employees themselves are necessarily receiving $64 an hour, period, but they're receiving maybe closer to $20 or $30 an hour. And then all the extra expenses, such as, um, you know, insurance and taxes and things that cranks that up there. And the real cost ends up being $64 an hour. Now, Tesla, their current per labor hour cost is 45 an hour. So Tesla is right now, uh, labor cost is 45 an hour and Ford's is 64 per hour. That is a significant difference. So if Ford wants to compete in this new market and survive a price war with Tesla, then Ford is going to have to adopt a new labor system with electric vehicles but the unions are not having this. GM has already caved on this and, um, and now the UAWs want Ford to guarantee as well that the new electric vehicle employees will be unionized. And GM caving on this has put Ford now stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because they come out, uh, the, you know, the come out here and uh, affects uh, how this will affect Kentucky will be a few ways. Obviously, uh, with that striking not going on, we got 8,700 uh, workers not working. Of course, that lowers tax revenues, obviously, into the state. 
But um, for right now, obviously, to, to kind of force this price comparison going on, one thing that the federal government is doing is they're actually going after Tesla uh, a whole lot in case you haven't noticed, and in a large part due to this dispute. Because the UAW is sitting there saying, well, um, we can't unionize because Tesla plants are lower. And they're saying, well, we can't unionize that. We have to compete with companies like Tesla. So the UAW is putting pressure on Biden, on that federal government to go after Tesla. So first, if the UAW can unionize Tesla plants and get similar contracts, well, then Ford doesn't get priced out of the market. Everything goes on. But the consumer, you and I, will have to pay more for vehicles. We'll have to. Uh, I mean, a 2.4% net profit doesn't actually leave a lot on the bone. Now, the second option here is Ford Caves and unionize electric vehicle plants without Tesla doing so, which means the number of employees hired in the Ford KY uh, uh, at the Ford um, KY battery plant is going to be lower as it can't grab enough of the market share as it was planning on. Because if it can step it to Tesla, it's going to grab more market share. That's more jobs here in Kentucky. But if it can't and it can't grab as much of the market, well, then that means they simply don't need as many people. Third and least likely, of course, is that Ford holds out and unionization doesn't happen. I say least likely, obviously, because GM has already caved. And, of course, the unions are going to keep their other demands uh, out there. Because if Ford meets their demands of 40% increase in 32-hour work weeks, and then they're just left holding the bag on unionizing electric vehicle plants, well, that could put, um, you know, the workers putting pressure on their union saying, we want to get back to work. They've met our demands that we care about. Um, but you know, honestly, I think everybody knows that with only a 2.5% profit margin Ford, without raising prices on their gas vehicles, potentially of course, causing less market share, their job loss. Well, um, they won't be able to acquiesce to that. And I think the unions, as I said, purposely asked for something so high. And what's worse about all this fight over unions is they can't even be honest. The companies can't be honest with the unions. They can't be honest with the employees of the unions. For an example, Elon Musk once tweeted out, uh, I think this is back in 2018, that if his plants unionized, well, then the workers would have to lose uh, stock options as a part of their compensation package. Obviously, a a necessary thing because suddenly now my cost per hour shoots up 20 bucks an hour. I got to hold on to more. I got to make more money somewhere. By not offering those stock options as part of the compensation package, well, that can help us reach it. And so when he tweeted that out, a judge ruled that this was a illegal tweet and amounted to retaliation against organized labor. You see, if it's just unions versus business owners, that'd be one thing. But then you have now this heavy hand of government coming in and basically forcing owners to agree to these unions and agree to whatever they say. And if a business owner says, well, you know, if you unionize, then I'll have to fire many of you and the business will invest more in automation because, well, we can't remain competitive in the marketplace if we have to unionize. Well, that would be wrong. You're told that's illegal to say, even though it's the truth. I mean, that's what a, a business would do. The more expensive labor gets, the more companies will seek to automate. But they're not even allowed to say this. I mean, right now, the unions are striking, saying that a company that makes 2.5% net profit is just a bunch of fat, greedy jerks and need to pay up. To say another way, imagine you own a business that makes a million a year gross and you invested a million to get it started. It's like your employee saying to you, you make too much and need to pay them more because you're making $25,000 a year. That's 2.5% of a million, $25,000 a year in profit. And I get it, you know, the 2.5% when it comes to Ford amounts to billions because, of course, those 2.5%, that pie is much larger than a million dollars. But so are the investments people are having to give. I mean, Ford is investing billions into their electric vehicle market. And so while everything, well, you may look at that and say, Andrew, that's not fair. That's a smaller thing. Well, it's to scale the same exact things. Everything is just more expensive. The business on cars doesn't cost a million to get into. It costs billions to get into. So so going back to the example, if you invest a million, well, if the business goes down, what do the employees lose? They lose a job. Yeah, they may go out, they go out and get another one. I know that can be harder than, of course, it sounds sometimes, but they didn't lose anything that they've thrown in. Like the time they put in, well, they got paid for that. But if the business goes down, the owner, in this case, would lose their million dollars they put in to start it. And of course, the work that they put in to make that money. 
or to uh, work that they've done in the business for free effort they put to it in hopes that their investment pays off. Well, they've lost it all. The employee hasn't lost anything. That's why businesses deserve to make a profit. That's why investors deserve to make a profit. They are risking far more than the workers ever will because they have no guarantee of pay while the employees do. You know, a great example of this uh, that somebody once uh, uh, um, gave an example on was if somebody pays you to dig uh, holes, digging for gold, let's say. They say, there's gold out here somewhere. I'm going to pay you $100 a hole to dig a hole. And on the hundredth hole, you find gold. And the owner comes in and says, oh, there we go. We found gold, takes the gold and sells it. Now you say, well, I deserve a piece of that pie. But what if you dug all those holes and you never found gold at all? Would you be willing to give that money back to the employee? Of course not. Now I get it. Sometimes you'll say this is different because these are all billionaires and everything else. But it's not. I mean, who owns Ford? Remember, Ford is publicly traded. And I'll give you a hint. It's not just a bunch of millionaires and billionaires. As uh, Bernie Sanders would like to say, pensions, retirement plans, 401ks that are put into hedge funds and then invested, money being risked and invested in businesses like Ford, that the hope is for a payoff. You know, people talk about, well, Ford's doing all these stock buybacks. Well, they do stock buybacks so that way when they have money now and investments paid off, they can then sell stock into the future to raise money to make the investments that they need to make. The money is not just going to a person to buy a private jet. It pays grandma's mortgage and puts foods on people's tables after they've retired. You see, the liberals, the socialists, and the Democrats, I've repeated myself, have gotten people to think of companies as mean or evil, that they've gotten you to hate CEOs because they get paid a lot, but they want you to forget who actually profits off these publicly traded companies. Sure, the CEOs get paid a lot, but it's a competitive marketplace. It's competitive. I mean, when you're trying to hire people to run billion dollar companies, and if you want to pay less, you're going to get lower talent and you're risking with bad leadership that investments don't pay off. And that risk actually falls on the everyday Americans when they're not paying their CEOs a bunch of money. Well, now that risk is falling to everyday Americans. They've gotten you to hate your neighbors, your next door your people next door that rely on companies like Ford making a profit to fund their retirements by pretending you're taking down the man when you demand a 32-hour work week while being paid 40% more. But who you're really hurting are those hardworking Americans. When your profit margins are just 2.5%, well, guess who pays for it? You do. Your neighbors do. They either get less return on their pensions and investments where the prices of things have to go up because when it's 2.5%, there's really not that much wiggle room. I get it. It's a larger scale, but it's still only 2.5%. Well, coming up, the first governor's debate has happened. We'll go over what we can learn from it after this short break. The first of several governor's debates occurred last week. Um, the next one here is tonight, Monday, here tonight in Northern Kentucky. It starts at 7 p.m. Uh, you can watch it on WCPO9, LEX18, WDRB there in Louisville, uh, WPSD Local 2, and WNKY News 40 there out west. And so the first debate has happened. What can we learn from it? Well, we've got to look at some possible strategies each campaign will take in the final month. First, Bashir's strategy, his plan clearly is to gaslight uh, himself as a great uniter and castigate Cameron as a divider. You'll see this, of course, in messaging, too. That's kind of flared up with the DNC's Twitter and other things. While at the same time, he's trying to co-opt some of the populism messaging that has made Trump so well and liked. I mean, this game plan isn't necessarily new, per se, for the Democrats. They love to move farther and farther left. And then when a Republican calls them out for it, well, it's a Republican dividing people, even though the Republican has stayed still. And it's the Democrat who was moving and creating the chasm in the process. And then they gaslight you when you yell about it and say, look, you're causing the problems here. I haven't moved, but somehow it's all your fault. Uh, the gaslighting, of course, too, uh, comes in in a few other ways. Uh, he'll take credit, of course, for things that the legislature has done that he either took no part in or actually fought them on. 
The other way is, of course, uh, getting you excited about mundane government things, things uh, uh, like uh, the states have always done and are not all that special. Bashir does this. Uh, the best example I can think of is things like sewer money, this clean drinking water money. It's pretty standard for the state to give out a few million to counties and cities uh, around the state for sewers, uh, water systems, utilities. Because remember, the state collects up all our sales tax, gas tax, income tax, insurance tax, tax list, L-L-E-T tax. The tax goes on and on. Then the state really doesn't owe much. Uh, own much, I'm sorry, of the roads. They have some state roads, of course. Um, they, they have some state buildings. They've got KSP and state courts, but the counties and cities own most of the roads and utility systems. The counties and cities are the ones providing you most of your daily government services. So it's pretty standard for the state to give out monies for the utility projects like sewer systems, monies they've collected up from those citizens and they're giving it back to them. But this mundane action of government hasn't changed this year from wasting more tax dollars and government time doing these elaborate check ceremonies. Now, I've talked about these before, but I find these things truly abhorrent. He goes down to these communities. So taxpayers, of course, pay for his drive down or his flying down. He sets up an event there that, of course, taxpayers pay for the people to come set up the events, the stages and everything. Then he hands them a big old check like they won the lottery. He'll put his signature at the bottom, even though he doesn't sign state checks. And then he'll put his name up top in the right hand corner as if it's coming from him and not you, the taxpayer. I mean, these are taxpayer dollars. And I can tell you, I've traveled the state, I've talked with county judge executives and city mayors. And if you won't give Andy his ceremony, he won't give you the money, period. I've ran into one county where they refused to give him the ceremony. And as of the time I was talking to them about six to eight months later, they still hadn't gotten the money. And then some of the places where he comes out and he does these ceremonies, well, then it takes them a while to even get the money from him for him to finally pony it up. So they're pretty gross. It's our money. And he wants a reward for putting those things, uh, putting that money towards things that government should do all anyway, like sewers, like waters, like utilities. But he wants a pat on the back for taking your money by force and then spending it on utility systems, one of the basic uses and systems of government. So he points to these things and says, well, I get things done, things that he has next to nothing to actually do, do with. And that is gaslighting on a huge scale. And then he tried, of course, uh, uh, tapping into the, um, you know, the, the um, populist messaging uh, to a point to get after Cameron for talking uh, as a response to Cameron for talking about Bashir supporting Biden. Now, Bashir came out and supported Biden and Cameron, rightly so, points this out and points out that, you know, Bashir's Biden's man in Kentucky and Bashir's just as far left as Biden is. Something he's clearly trying to do, as we've covered in past podcasts, because Biden is so clearly uh, unpopular, especially in Kentucky. Now, I in prior podcasts, I talked about how Kentucky uh, politics really kind of divorces itself from national politics and Bashir's retort on the fact that he knows Kentucky kind of divorces itself from national politics when it comes to governor and state elections. He had a retort that was a smart one, clearly something he practiced. He responded by saying that Cameron is focusing on D.C. issues while Bashir is putting Kentucky first. The Kentucky first messaging, that is tapping into that po populism. You know, the America first kind of message that comes from Trump, that, that populist message. Well, Bashir's trying to tap into that and attempt to pull in more of those Trump voters. Now, I've heard a lot of Republicans wondering aloud about this mythical Trump voter that'll vote for Bashir. I've heard podcasts about it. I sat in a meeting uh, last week uh, with some members of parties and members of, of Cameron's campaign. And, you know, that was an issue talked about is these these phantom Trump voters that none of them have ever seen or heard of. But I, I want to remind you a few things of why there is almost a, it's not huge, but like a 10% crossover. First, during the 2016 elections, 12% of Bernie Sanders voters, very far left individual, voted for Trump. Now, our 12% of Bernie Sanders voters didn't vote at all, but 12% voted for Trump. Why? Well, there's a real hate for politicians that seem to only uh, to seem to care about the people last. Tell people, sit in the corner, shut up. I don't care about your needs. I want to do what I think is important. You know, the traditional Republican, the neocon war hawks, these people are the real turnoffs to the rule 
Kentucky voters. You know, think of like the Oliver Anthony type, you know, the singer, right? The rural person who works their butts off while the government forgets about them and taxes the, the crap out of them and makes their pay shorter, makes it harder on the working man. That's a Trump voter. But that's also someone who will vote for a Democrat that appears to do the same things. They're not party tied. Anybody willing uh, 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 to, to go ahead and tell them, I care about you, I care about your needs, you've been forgotten by government, but I'm here to help you, they will listen to. This is why Eastern Kentucky was such a Democrat stronghold for so long until Democrats, of course, started coming after coal, their jobs, and being extremes on guns and babies. These working people, because now the Democrats were the, also the people leaving them behind, these people, they don't care about party. They just care about the fact they're being screwed over. And honestly, Bashir has done a better job messaging to this voter than Cameron has. Bashir hasn't done a better job for them because Cameron could talk about wasteful spending and programs that government puts together that Bashir's decide to fund that only uh, f help people who are having sex with the right person or has the right skin color. Things that message to those hard workers and point out what Bashir has done to screw them over. Even messaging harder on the unemployment disaster, you know, the unemployment system that still isn't fixed, despite Republicans giving Bashir all the resources and money he would need to fix it. That's messaging that could be potent for the rural working man, the person that Bashir's winning over with his Kentucky first. Look at all the great things I've done for you through government. That messaging he's doing, you could win them over by pointing out all the things he's done bad. Now on to Cameron's performance during the debate. Cameron hit Bashir on, of course, his far left ties and his endorsement of Biden. He also pointed out, uh, Cameron did, um, that he could get things done because the legislature, obviously, and he's referencing his catch-up plan here, that he can work with the legislature. Bashir doesn't. Pointing out, of course, Bashir's promises on education are lies. Obviously, as I've gone over in this podcast, Bashir has promised year after year after year a raise to the teachers, yet can't get it done. So they're lies. Now, what I wish Cameron would do is get passionate about some points, get something in over Bashir's failures, not just COVID either, saying with passion, Bashir says he cares about you. Did he care about you when he unemployed you and sent you into a broken unemployment system, a system he still hasn't fixed? Did he care about you when he wanted to force quarantine and possible arrest because you God-loving Kentuckians went to church? on Easter? Did he care about you when he had abused children sleeping on the floor of cabinet for health and family services offices because his failure to fix it for now over a year? Does he care about you when his mismanagement of the juvenile justice system has led to the violent sexual assault, multiple assaults now, of a minor girls? Does he care about you when he puts in place racist policies and building a government that takes your money and then gives it to people as long as they identify the right way? Does he care about you when all of his economic development schemes he loves for you to vote for, for him for, putting in place, involves taking millions from you, hardworking people, and giving it to billion-dollar corporations? Is that caring about you? That's not caring about you. That's using you and using your money. It's time we elect somebody who, when he says he cares about you and is here to serve the people, he means it. Now, that would send a message. But Bashir, he can't say this. I'm sorry, Cameron <laughs> can't say this for two reasons. First, unfortunately, Cameron most likely agrees with the hundreds of millions being given to private corporations. That's very unfortunate. The second reason, well, I don't know if Cameron has that kind of passion in him, that kind of righteous indignation. I don't know if he has it in him. Because that righteous indignation, that, that anger, that tired of government letting you down, taking your money, as I said, and wasting it away, that comes from being a career, hardworking individual that's fed up. It doesn't come from a career politician with both. Remember, both Bashir and Cameron are career politicians. I hope. And these next debates, we start seeing some of that fire from Cameron, if he can deliver it. A fire to really take down Bashir and let him know, put him on notice. Don't keep messaging on these manby pamby lines. They haven't worked in the past. Stop doing it. 
point out his failures even outside of COVID and take him down and remind everybody what kind of monster he really is. He can put on his Mr. Rogers attitude and his little sweater and his emergency management jacket and swear he's there for you, but he's a failure. Point out his failures. Western Kentucky Relief Fund, his management of that. Point out his failures and do it with passion, not casual politician, but do it with somebody who's righteously and correctly upset with the way this is going. Now, that's what we have time for for you all listening on the video format on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, Rumble. But for those of you listening to the podcast format, Bear with us after this short break. We're going to be talking about the uh, Louisville city government putting in place um, some of these uh, feminine product dispensers into men's bathrooms. We'll be covering that after this short break. If you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, Rumble uh, or, or Twitter, head on over to the podcast format and listen to this last story. It's a doozy. Uh, we'll see you after this. Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness, uh, as a part of a pilot project, which is a, a joint effort between the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness and um, the Office for Women, uh, which is interesting that the Office for Women, so a department meant for women, um, is putting in uh, dispensers that carry free menstrual products in 18 restrooms. They're at the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness um, inside their uh, uh, departments there. That is pretty crazy, uh, to say the least. Now, this is run by, it would appear, of course, to be run by the city of Louisville. After all, its department is on the Louisville KY uh, government website. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because, of course, health departments um, are typically run by state statute and kind of a part of cabinet for health and family services kind of runs them. It appears this is more of a, of a city side of things. Um, according to uh, their website here, the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness um, is a department that focuses on administration, environmental health services, and center, of course, for health equity. And they've decided to take this crazy route of putting menstruation uh, products in the men's bathroom. As I said, it's funny that this is a partnership between the Center for Women because you'd wonder, what is the Center for Women caring at all about what goes on in a men's bathroom? I mean, after all, isn't their mission supposed to be to focus on women? And even if we buy into uh, either, either they're admitting by doing that. They're either admitting that trans men are not men, they're women. Therefore, they fall under the department of, uh, under the, the auspices of, um, this organization that's supposed to be for health of women or, or, um, suddenly this department is taking its resources and spending it on men and promoting uh, uh, men now. And if I was a woman in Louisville, I'd be pretty upset. I thought this department, this organization is supposed to focus on my needs, not the needs of men. And of course, this idea that men menstruate is this crazy far left idea that of course, that a, a person who identifies as a man can somehow is somehow having periods because of course, they're not a man, they're a woman. Same idea that they have of this man can get pregnant. Um, well, men can't get pregnant. Uh, that is women who can get pregnant. And of course, Cameron and others in the Republican Party jumped on this to point out how crazy, uh, of course, this is. This is insanity, which it is insanity, to offer up these types of items at this place. Now, what I loved is, is the people trying to defend this, um, saying, well, you know, they're just putting it up. One comment I saw, they're just putting it up so men can help women in their lives who are menstruating, which is crazy. I've never heard of a man, an actual man, carrying around tampons and pads on his person um, just in case somebody around him needs one. I mean, if you're a woman and you're sitting uh, around talking with your gal pals and you're like, oh man, 
um, does anybody have a, a tampon or a pad? And a guy leans over and he's like, I got one for you. Wouldn't that freak you out? That'd be a little strange. Wouldn't it? I know women, of course, uh, or at least I'm told that women will share these types of items as needed. And that makes sense. But but to have a guy lean in, that would be very strange. I would look at him like he's weird. You would look at him like he's weird. Any sane person would look at this and say, this is absolutely ridiculous. And it's just another example of taxpayer funded craziness. These are the types of things to point out that are happening right now with your dollars. That isn't just happening with the Louisville government, but also happening with Bashir and his state policies. This is something to zero in on. Like I said, Cameron tweeted this out. Other people tweeted this out to point out how crazy it is, point out how crazy Democrats are for buying into this lie, this crazy lie, but pointing out that these types of programs are going on all over the place here in Kentucky and this push that men are women and women are men and blah, 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 blah. That runs deep in the Bashir administration. We saw him veto, of course, the bill protecting women's sports. Um, we've seen him, of course, veto any bills to address the trans epid epidemic as it should be as a mental health crisis that these people are not mentally healthy to think you're a different gender is not mentally healthy to actually believe you're a different gender than what you are is not good you hate your body you hate the body you're born in generally speaking when somebody hates the body they're born in we say that is a person who's struggling mentally they need our help what we don't do is buy so much into that confusion buy so much in to that lie they're telling themselves so much so that we're going to provide them menstruation uh, uh, items, pads and tampons in a men's bathroom to somehow say that this is perfectly normal for a man to menstruate. Isn't perfectly normal. Not at all. It isn't normal. It isn't normal for men to have to sit down to pee either. I'm just saying that. I said it, okay? I'm just saying that men generally don't have to sit down to pee. I know some men maybe do. But, uh, but yeah, generally speaking, men stand and pee at urinals or into toilets. Um, but of course, you know, I'm just talking as, as long as we're talking about men's bathrooms here, I didn't bring it up. The crazy far left people did. As long as we're talking about that, uh, I just want to plug in that men don't typically sit down to pee. Um, that is not a thing men do. Maybe, uh, men, of course, who are struggling with mobility and things like that, they may do that. Uh, but, but that isn't the, the at large at whole men, men who can comfortably walk around, um, and are not having some medical situation going on. Don't sit down to pee. Um, and I think that's important to say, because if we're talking about that, what's next, I, are, are you going to put, you're going to put feminine hygiene, uh, 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 um, those, those special feminine hygiene trash cans, uh, that you have in women's bathrooms are going to start putting those in men's. You're just providing them uh, pads and tampons. What about those feminine care boxes? Have you installed them? You're not being inclusive enough because of course you're not supposed to flush those things. And so if you don't have a place for them to throw it away in every single bathroom, well, you're not being inclusive enough. I just want to remind you. Okay. I mean, this is ridiculous. But this is what we have to look forward to. This is where the Democrats are going. This is how far left they are. Even in extremely red states like Kentucky, we can have city governments putting feminine products in a men's bathroom, buying into the lie that men menstruate. It's crazy. Completely, completely crazy. Well, y'all, that's what we have time for today on the Andrew Kierbrider Show. Thank you all so, so much for joining us. We'll be back here tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Have a great rest of your day.